and the protests at Standing Rock are only the latest example in the 500 year long history of Native American resistance to environmental threats. To discuss this, we're now being joined by Native American professor and historian and author Ward Churchill. Ward, thanks for being with us today. I, I want to start with the situation there at Standing Rock. Um, why do you think the resistance to, the, to, to DAPL has been so fierce, even uh, in the face of increasingly militarized police action against the crowds? Well, there's a whole range of reasons, but probably the cut line is there's no place left to go. Indians have been shoved off into the dusty, considered to be useless corners of the continent to die out, out of sight and out of mind. And this is the consummation. So there's no place to back up to. They're talking about potentially contaminating the water supply in a destitute reservation, running it under land that was already illegally taken from these people, which was their best farmland, the most arable land, uh, sacred sites such that are flooded. You've got to make a stand somewhere. And this is where. And it's, it's that they have no other place to go, a you're saying. process, all right? But look, Dapple, they could have run that across the Missouri River. It still would have been opposed, but they could have run that thing across the Missouri River north of Bismarck, which stood the risk then of contaminating the water supply for the state capital, which is predominantly white population. So they moved it down to just a mile north of Standing Rock because you got an expendable population in the minds of the policymakers of the United States. You talk about national sacrifice areas, and essentially you're also talking about national sacrifice peoples, except that those peoples are not of the nation. They are their own nations. Now, in your book, the, the struggle for land, Native North American resistance to genocide, ecocide, and colonization, it documents the American government's um, systematic exploitation of, of Native people's land and violent elimination of, of Native communities, as you just referenced just now. How does this historical analysis uh, play into today's struggle at Standing Rock? Well, it's been since day one, Native people have been reduced, liquidated, relocated, transferred, suppressed, oppressed, repressed, their land taken for the benefit of a settler population, use and benefit, profitability, and so on. Their resources, the way the West looks, or your Americans look at, such things, their mineral wealth, their water, their timber, and so forth, has been utilized to the benefit of the settler society. They've been left destitute. They've been left consigned on in areas that are not considered habitable or worth inhabiting by the general population and so forth, all for profit. If you extracted the treaty territories, just removed the treaty ter territories, okay from the corp territorial corpus of the United States, given the mineral disposition, the United States economy would collapse tomorrow. Okay? You got $137 billion in so-called trust assets, that is the wealth that accrued from mineral utilization by the United States from indigenous property, even in its reduced state over a 100-year period. Forensic accountants determined it a total unpaid royalties on that and accrued interest in the rest came to $137 billion. You've got the most impoverished population as an aggregate in all of North America, from whom yeah. $137 billion have been taken historically, and that's an ongoing now, going process. On, so on that note, on that note, Ward, about, about history, given the violent history between the American government and the Native peoples, um, do you think that this sort of history, the attitude that comes from it, do you think this still uh, remains, and do you think that it, it, it shapes the way uh, corporations like the Dapple uh, company that's making this Dapple pipeline, do you think they, it influences how they view Native rights? Sure. 
many people have no rights that uh, a corporation is bound to observe. And I'm paraphrasing the uh, an old Supreme Court case that related to the Af African American population. It's that attitude. And Indians get in the way of the profitability and convenience of those in charge in the United States. They'll be liquidated one way or another. And that can go this slow, agonizing, intergenerational death spiral that's been going on, or it can be quicker. And by the way, with all due respect to your last guest, there is no such thing as a rubber bullet. They're firing hard plastic bullets from assault weapons at less than 10 feet range at peaceful protesters, okay? They're real serious about this, and they will kill people if necessary. They would prefer not to because it's bad press, but they'll continue to ratchet this up. And it's not just the police that's involved in this. You have these mercenary forces, in this case, uh, an outfit called Tiger Swan, which is a spinoff of Blackwater oh, that's oh. run by a former Delta Force colonel and using special operatives. And it's really difficult to separate out what the police are doing and what this mercenary group that's been retained by Energy Transport Corporation is doing. But the appearance is, to some analysts, that the mercenary group, the private group, the uh, highly militarized uh, expertise that's available in that is essentially commanding the police. Certainly a lot of, of strong uh, statements for the, the officials over at Standing Rock. We'll keep an eye on this and hopefully we'll have you back on. we got to leave that right there. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Native American professor, historian, and author, Mr. Ward Churchill.